Good evening. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. This is the Calvary Grace Evening Service. Will you bow your heads with me? Precious Heavenly Father, as we turn to your word, just bring it alive. Let it have impact. Let it strengthen. Let it boost. Let it lift. Let it warn. In Jesus' name, amen. It's amazing how small things can affect not just you, but sometimes tens of people, hundreds of people, thousands of people, millions of people, and even billions of people. And today we're going to look at one of those small things which transpired in the Word of God, but affects you even to this day. Before we do, Turn with me to Galatians chapter 6, verse 8. Galatians chapter 6, verse 8. The one who sows to please the sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let's not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, We'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. Therefore, as you have opportunity, do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. As a man sows, so shall he reap. What we do will come back on us, whether it's good or bad. This is not karma. This is a law that God has placed in place. Karma states that what you do will come back in the next life. This is talking about this life. The one who sows to please the sinful nature, as a man sows, so shall he reap. From that nature will reap destruction. The one that sows to please the Spirit of God, from the Spirit of God will reap eternal life. Let's not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. Therefore, as you have opportunity, do good to all people, especially those that belong to the family of believers. I want to show you a wrong that was committed many, many thousands of years ago, which has affected you today and our world that stands on the brink of nuclear war is directly affected by what I'm about to show you. Before I go there, I want to take you to Exodus chapter 3. In Exodus chapter 3, we have Moses is an 80-year-old man who looks out across the desert of Saudi Arabia. And over the Arabian sands, he sees on the horizon something very odd. A tree that's on fire but doesn't burn up. Now Moses is tending the flocks of his father-in-law, Jethro. And he's moving fairly slowly. So anything on the horizon that's on fire should have burned up before he got there. But it continues to burn lively. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within the bush. And Moses saw that through the bush, pardon me, that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. 
then Moses, uh, pardon me, then the Lord saw, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Don't come any closer. God said, take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. This must have been quite a shock. God not only called Moses by name, but he mentioned his family and his family tree. He mentioned his genealogy. And he announced that he was the same God that had protected the entire family from 430 years earlier. I am the God of Abraham. I'm the one that made a deal with Abraham. I'm the God of Isaac. And I'm the God of Jacob. And Jacob was the last patriarch of the group to come into Egypt. Abraham and Isaac being dead by that stage. And so this must have been quite a shock as God speaks to him, calls him by name, and then calls out his family tree right in front of him and says, now listen, I was their God 430 years back. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt and I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. First of all, the term milk and honey. Milk would indicate grass. Grass for pasture land. Remember, Moses is standing in a desert right now. It can be up to 130 degrees. He and the sheep are suffering under the punishing heat of a place we know now as El Luz. It's in Saudi Arabia, lower Saudi Arabia. And he hears from God that God wants to bring him into a land with grass. I tell you, shepherds love that. It means food for their sheep and their cattle. But he goes even further. He says, a land flowing with milk and honey. Milk tells us that the sheep and the cattle will have grass. Honey tells us that there are flowers and bees. And this must have been such an amazing thought. A land flowing with milk and honey. And then the Lord says something kind of strange. The home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. What he just named here was one family that was in this land. We know them under one major heading, but this family had broken up into tribes we call them the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The Jebusites living, of course, in Jerusalem. But all of these people, collectively, we call Canaanites. Canaanites. Now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people 
the Israelites out of Egypt. Now this land that he's going to give them was currently being lived in. And God said, I'm going to give you this land. It's a good and spacious land. We know it today as Israel. It's a land that flows with sustenance for your animals, milk for your children, honey for your food, flowers and beauty. It's a beautiful land. But currently, there's a very large family living in it. It is the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. All this family shares one thing in common. They're the children of Ham. This is Hamite land. Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter 9, verse 18. The sons of Noah that came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. Remember? Canaanite. Canaan. Canaan's kids live in this land. These were the three sons of Noah that came uh, and, and from them came the people that are scattered over the earth. Noah, a man of the soil, presented, uh, pr proceeded to plant a vineyard. And when he had drunk some of its wine, he became drunk and he lay uncovered in his tent. Now he's not uncovered in the camp, he's uncovered in his tent. And yes, he had foolishly gotten drunk on the wine that he had made. This means, incidentally, that from the time they got off the ark, there had to be at least a season pass by where they could plant and reap. And I would suggest maybe even a few seasons. Ham. Verse 22, the father of Canaan, again, Canaanite. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid across their shoulders and they walked in backward and covered their father's nakedness. Their, their, nakedness. their faces were turned the other way so they would not look on their father's nakedness. But Noah, when he woke from his wine, found out what his youngest son had done to him, and he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of the slaves, he will be to his brothers. He said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend the territory of Japheth. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem. And may Shem, pardon me, may Canaan be his slave. After the flood of Noah, lived 350 years and altogether Noah lived 950 years and then he died the question is what actually happened here what really transpired if you take the reading of the text just as it is and you're dumb enough to read it straightforward you're going to believe that Ham saw his dad naked and began to mock him when he went outside and told the other two boys about it. And they respectfully took a garment or a blanket, walked in backwards so as not to look on their dad, and they covered up his nakedness. Now that's the dumb way to interpret it. And let me tell you the truth, that's exactly how I interpret it. Now I want to give you the smart way that's being taught these days. First of all, amongst the Jews, some believe that he had homosexual sex 
with his father while he was drunk. I see nothing in the text to indicate that. But they're trying to understand why would Noah wake up and curse his grandson? And then somebody came up with a very bright idea. And here it is. Take your Bibles, turn to Leviticus chapter 18, verse 1. Leviticus 18, 1. This is the current thinking today. This is being taught all over Canada and the States right now. It said, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You must not do as they do in Egypt, where you used to live, and you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan. It's the son of Ham, where I am bringing you. Do not follow their practices. You must obey my laws and be careful to follow my decrees. I am the Lord your God. Keep my decrees and laws, uh, laws for the man who obeys them will live by them. I am the Lord. No one is to approach a close relative to have sexual relations. I am the Lord. He keeps signing it with, I am the Lord. It's like saying, I am the final authority, and I'm telling you, this is what you're to do. Do not dishonor your father by having sexual relations with your mother. She is your mother. Do not have relations with her. Now, let me read that to you. Actually, let's read verse 8. Do not have sexual relations with your father's wife. That would dishonor your father. Let me read that to you out of the King James. Verse 8, out of the King James. The nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. Now here's what they're doing. They're taking that line and applying that to Genesis. Genesis. And here's what they're saying. Noah got off the ark, planted a vineyard, got drunk. In his drunkenness, an inability to respond, Cain came, uh, 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 pardon me, Ham came in and had sex with his mother. And therefore, she became pregnant. And therefore, she was going to have a son by the name of Canaan. And that's why Noah, when he comes around, didn't curse Ham, but cursed Canaan. And I gotta tell you, that theory sounds really good if you ignore the facts. It really sounds like that could be it. Maybe that's what happened. Maybe. Maybe Ham went in there, saw his father drunk. There weren't too many women around. Let's face it, he had only his wife and the wives of his brothers. And there's his mother, and so he decides to molest her. And she gets pregnant. So Noah curses the child. The only problem is, it doesn't work with the text. And what you've got to do here is a thing called collapsing the argument. Collapsing the context. It's a mistake in interpreting Scripture to completely collapse the context. Let me give you a silly example. Judas went out and hung himself. There's one Scripture. And there's another Scripture called or said, says, do thyself likewise. We can now connect the two scriptures, make a doctrine, by collapsing all context. So now it would read, Judas went out and hung himself, do thyself likewise. And what you're seeing here 
is a very blatant collapsing of the context. You see, it just doesn't work. And I'll tell you why it doesn't work. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness and told his two brothers outside. Now, first of all, Canaan is already alive. He's mentioned in the text before whatever happens. Number one. Number two. Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders and walked in backwards and covered their father's nakedness. Now, if Ham had had sex with his mother, why on earth would the two boys now walk in and cover up their father? It just doesn't make sense. If you collapse the context and play on the King James language, it looks exactly like we now have an explanation for what actually happened. Some of the Jewish rabbis today will tell you it was a homosexual act. None of that appears in the text. They're reaching for straws. I think it is exactly what it tells you it is. I think under the ancient ways of thinking that Ham walks in, sees his dad drunk and naked, and he begins to mock him. And then he goes outside and he begins to mock him in front of the other boys. Now remember, this is the man that God spoke to that said was, was righteous. This is the man that was the only one that was righteous in his generation. This is the man that God came along to and said, listen, I want you to build an ark. And built an ark and saved himself and his family. This is the man that was worthy of the deepest and most profound respect, just as a man of God, not to mention his son, who should have covered up his father's sin. Love covers a multitude of sins. And what we're seeing here is no love from him. And so then the question is, well, why, when Noah comes around, would he not curse Ham? He says, cursed is Canaan, Ham's son. Now, if Canaan's not born yet, then how does this work? Canaan has to be alive at this stage. And no, and... He will look at him and he will curse Canaan. Hmm. And here's the curse. May he be the lowest of slaves. The lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. So the Cain and his family, which we know now is the land that God is going to give to Moses and his family, is going to be lower. He's going to be a servant or a slave. He also said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Now, Shem we know a great deal about because he becomes the Shemitic people or Semitic people, as we would say in English. He represents the Semitic tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. Rather interesting. As Ham has done this, may his offspring be cursed. May God extend the territory of Japheth. Well, here's how this shakes out. You are one of three. You are either a Hamite, a Japhethite, 
or a Semite. And I'm going to suggest that if you're not Jewish, you're very likely not a Semite. But if you're from most of the rest of the world, you're a Japhethite. May God extend the territory of Japheth. Japheth fills up the rest of the world. Ham and his family stay generally in the southern part of Israel and northern Africa. We'll deal with that in a moment. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem. That's Israel. May the Japhethites live in the tents of Israel. You know, we always kid around about picking out a piece of property in Israel because one day we're going there. And I don't mean we're going there for a visit. I mean, when the Lord comes back, we're moving to Israel. Somebody say amen. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem. Why would Japheth be able to live in the tents of Shem? Because the Messiah would take Jew and Gentile and bring them together in the church. May Canaan be his slave. Each time he begins to talk and pronounce a blessing on the other boys, it has a little edge to it of a curse that falls consistently on Canaan. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years, and altogether Noah lived 950 years, and he died. By the way, he's almost one of the oldest men in the Bible. Methuselah lives 969 years this boy lives 950 years. Take your Bibles and turn with me now to Genesis chapter 10, verse 6. Genesis chapter 10, verse 6. And here we begin to see the families as God lays them out. Genealogies in the Bible are very important, whether you Understand them or like them or not, doesn't matter. They're extremely important. And maybe you'll see a little bit of why in a second here. The sons of Ham, okay, are Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. Cush, Cush, we know them today as the Cushites. And remember, Moses will have a Cushite wife. We know them as Ethiopians. These are Africans. Ham's sons moved into northern Africa. Then you have Mizraim. You know that today as well. But we call it Egypt. And then you have Put. And that's the Libyan countries in Africa. And then you have Canaan. And Canaan are all the nations that generally surround Israel. The Canaanites. The sons of Cush, Seba, Helviah, Sabata, Ramah, Sabteca, the sons of Ramah, Sheba and Dedan. You know that today as Saudi Arabia. Cush was the father of Nimrod. Nimrod, who grew to be a mighty warrior on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That's why it's said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now let's just realize here we are dealing with the cursed line. This is the cursed line of Ham. And when we come down to Nimrod here, Nimrod is a kingdom builder, but not in a good way. And when the Bible talks about a mighty hunter in the face of the Lord, it's really a mighty hunter kind of in spite of the Lord. It's as though what he's doing is sticking his chin out, stealing himself against the Lord. 
He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That's why it said, like, a, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The first of his kingdom, of his kingdoms were Babylon. It starts from cursed seed. And now it comes down to the first of his kingdoms are Babylon, then Erach, then Achad, then Kelna, then in Shinar. This is where the ark comes to, to rest, in the plain of Shinar. And from that land he went to Assyria where he built Nineveh. These are groups of people who steeled themselves against God. Rehoboth, Ur, Kelna, and Rezin, which is between Nineveh and Kelna. That is the great city. Mizraim was the father of the Luddites, or Luddites, Anamites, Lehabites, and Naphtahites. Parthashites, Kelashites, and from whom the Philistines came, and the Caphrites. From whom the Philistines came came. These are people that would set themselves up against God and against Israel. Verse 15, Canaan was the father of Sidon, his firstborn, and of the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, Girgashites, Hivites, Archites, Sinites, Arvidites, Zemzerites and Hamathites. Later, the Canaanite clans scattered, and the borders of Canaan reached from Sodom, pardon me, from, from Sidon towards Gerar, as far as where they are today, Gaza, and then towards Sodom and Gomorrah. That's down by the Dead Sea. Admar, Zebulon, as far as Lesha. These are the sons of Ham by their clans in their territories and nations. This is a cursed line. And from them come cities that are so wicked, on one occasion God will rain down fire, brimstone, and destroy them. On another occasion, he will send a prophet, the prophet Jonah, and Jonah will come in and he'll tell them to repent and they will repent and God will relent and God will forgive them for a period of time, about a hundred years. At the end of that time, he destroys Nineveh. But just think about this. It all starts with a day in the life of Ham. A day that Ham decided to make a fool of God's man. The day that Ham decided to mock his dad, who was God's man, despite the condition he was in at that moment, he was still God's man. And the boys that decided not to join in with the gossip, not to join in with the activities that were going on in the camp. Those God blessed. Japheth goes out and he literally fills the world. Most of the nations of the world are Japhethite. The Semitics, they are certainly Israel. And there may be some argument that they made it as far as England and that there are indeed potentially Semitic peoples that formed England. It's a very tenuous argument, but it's possible. However, we also know that there today are Jews in every nation of the world. God blesses them wherever they go. 
And the sons of Ham are the servants and slaves and a thorn in the flesh of all that God does. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, it says this, The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you'll be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he set out for Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people that they had acquired in Haran and set out for the land of Canaan. And they arrived there. The whole story then is about the conquering of Canaan's fair land. And it absolutely was. It flowed with milk and honey. It was the most choice and beautiful land. But the Canaanites had moved in. And with it, every pagan practice you can imagine and many you can't even imagine. Every filthy and wicked thing the Canaanites were doing in that land. Abel, Abram traveled the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moriah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Again, the Bible keeps telling you this. The Canaanites were in the land. This is Canaanite land. Why is it such a big deal? Because it starts on the day that Ham curses his father. And his father, instead of cursing Ham, basically says to him, may your son be ashamed to you as you are ashamed to me. May your son be cursed for what you have done to your father. To your offspring, I'll give this land. God is speaking to Abram now. To your offspring, I'm going to give Canaan's land. But what about the Canaanites that live there? Too bad. You see, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And since he owns it, he can give the property to whoever he wishes. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there on, he went toward the hills east of Bethel, that means house of God, and pitched his tent with Bethel on the West and Ai on the east, he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. And Abraham set out and continued toward the Legev and so on. All of that transpired because one day Ham decided to mock his dad who was God's man. And to this day the Canaanites are still trying to take the land from the Semites. That's why you pay what you pay for gas. That's why the world is on the edge of nuclear war. That's why all of the things that are transpiring now all started on the day that Ham decided to mock is dead. You see, as a man sows, so shall he reap. Watch your decisions. Watch the things that you decide to do because know this, they will come back, they will affect you, and they will affect your children and your children's children to the third and fourth generation. Be very cautious and very careful of how you live your life. The entire world is on pins and needles right now because of the war between the Canaanites and the Semites. Is it that he went in there and had sex with his mother? No, I, I don't see that at all. That, to do that, you've got to collapse all the context. You've got to join things together that don't join together. 
You've got to deny the fact that the Bible talks about Canaan before ever this happens. I think it's also very possible that Canaan joined in the mockery of his granddad. That's my conjecture. But what happened here was a pivotal moment in history. And we are feeling the net effects of it even today. Watch how you live your life. It really counts. Will you bow your heads with me? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Lord God, help us to live a life that is worthy before you. Help us to live up to the calling you've placed upon us. Forgive us for our iniquities. Hold us ever close to you. Let us be led by your spirit. Let us do what is right in your sight. Thank you, Father, for you alone are God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.